Hey Mitch, so the other day I was looking for some wisdom, so I decided to pop into a herbalist. Now there was no wisdom to be found there, but they did give me some sage advice. Very good, very oh good. My God, terrible. That I, is the worst. <laughs> I feel obligated to tell a joke now, a Do metaphysical it, absolutely, joke. Okay. Absolutely, go for it. Uh, how, I hope everybody will have just a great sense of humor about this. Uh, how many Christian scientists does it take to change a light bulb? How many? There is no bulb, and Mrs. Eddie doesn't think you're funny. So, oh, my God. That's, that's my joke. Yeah. I, lo I love right. it. <laughs> love all my friends in the Christian Science Church. Let's all be able to laugh at ourselves. That's so, all. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Wow, that was amazing. I have to say that was so good. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. My name is Douglas Batchelor, and today... We are back with another Fool's Gallery episode. Now, the Fool's Gallery is basically where I find a, a figure uh, that is big in either the occult or the esoteric, and we will get into what they added to this world of magic and the esoteric. So, today we have a titan. This is a big one. This is a huge one. So, many folks are familiar with the name and perhaps a few concepts, things like the Astral or the Akashic Records, but their knowledge ends there. It is time to set this right. Today, I am joined by someone who is not only familiar with our subject today, but who I feel gets to the very essence of this larger-than-life character. We are talking about Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and my guest is a historian of the occult and esoteric, an amazing author of such books as The Miracle Club and Occult America and many more, as well as perhaps for my money, one of the most eloquent lecturers you will ever come across in any realm. Today, I am joined by the one and only Mitch Horowitz. Mitch, how are you? I'm great. Good to be here, man. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's dive right in because this is a big one. So before we get talking about HPB, which is what I might say every once in a while, just to make it a little bit easier. But when I say HPB, that is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. But before we get talking about her, what was going on in spirituality at the time of the 19th century uh, before Helena stepped in? Well, uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky is very often credited with instigating an occult revival uh, in the latter 19th century, and I think that's very right. There were simmerings of an occult revival uh, emanating from the work of the French occultist who went by the name uh, Eliphas Levy. And Eliphas Levy, who wrote a, a book that is is sometimes called Doctrine and Ritual, Ritual of High Magic, uh, which came out in uh, two volumes in 1854, was probably the first modernist figure who began uh, a kind of post Renaissance occult revival. And his ideas, often brilliant, often fanciful, introduced concepts like uh, tarot and spell work and numerology and various esoteric symbolism into the minds of artists and intellectuals. Uh, you know, I suppose what you could call a post-romantic, early modernist age. The romantics themselves engaged in a kind of artistic occult revival, redefining concepts of the satanic and engaging in a revival of, apropos of their name, uh, Roman Greek era uh, portraiture of gods, myth, deities. We often forget that the root of romantic is Roman. Uh, so there have been there were simmerings. There were simmerings of an occult revival, but it was really Madame Blavatsky who brought this all to the forefront and actually may have coined the term occultism or at least popularized the term. We have the term occult, of course, uh, emanating from the Renaissance, it being uh, rooted in the Latin for secret uh, or hidden. And uh, the adaptation occultism may have come directly from Madame Blavatsky. That's At amazing. least in English. You know. Right. Amazing. Yeah, and uh, I believe a lot of Blavatsky's concepts of the astral come directly from Eliphas Levy. They're, they're basically like wholesale, but... Well, some. They were certainly cross-pollination. And, and she had a wide array of sources, which over time, especially later in her life, tended to become... Uh, more Vedic and less oriented towards what we might consider modernist Western occultism. 
and some of her concepts, including ones that you were referencing, the the uh, this akasha, this universal ether that has its roots in Vedism. Nice, for sure. It's it's tough with the amount of biographies because there are a ton of biographies of Blavatsky, but also Blavatsky's story of herself, her own history. She inserted a lot of, let's say, um, wonderment and and adventure into her story. But what details do we know of the young Helena von Hahn, which was her original name? Well, in terms of the most strict forensic details, she was born in 1831 in what is Ukraine, uh, a region that is, of course, war-torn now, sadly. And her the, the home in which she was born is a historical site in Ukraine. She was a figure of minor Russian nobility. She grew up in what would be considered the outer reaches of Russia's aristocracy. She married young and unhappily, was divorced young, began to uh, traverse the world, at least according to her own accounts, uh, uh, getting into that part of the biography that is not as forensically verifiable. She came into contact with what she maintained were hidden adepts of wisdom from the Eastern world, uh, ranging from Egypt to Tibet. In the early 1870s, traveled to the United States uh, based on her interest in the movement called spiritualism or talking to the dead, and very soon made history uh, in New York City with the uh, co-founding of the Theosophical Society, an organization that continues today, in 1875. From the younger Blavatsky, is there any kind of inkling that she would be the spiritual juggernaut that way she was is there any kind of like a an, an occurrence or a, a circumstance that would later blossom into she wasn't an enormous character so was there anything yeah. that happened in, uh, earlier on in her life well there was always a profound streak of independence and heterodoxy uh, in hpb when she was a young woman she was deeply read she was well traveled She was profoundly uncomfortable with the role of noble wife who hosted tea parties and readings of light poetry and violin recitals and maybe a a seasonal ball here and there. That was as opposite to her character as 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 anything that, that you could imagine. And she does seem to have started traveling at a fairly young age, including a trip to an early world's fair in uh, may have been 1851 in London. So she was still quite a a young woman. She would have been 20, maybe 21 around that age. And she said at this world expo in what was then uh, the metropolis of the world, London was considered in some ways, maybe London and to a degree Paris, the, the beating heart culturally of the world, although Paris was still steeped in the aftermath of Napoleonism, so it, it maybe didn't fully regain its stature just yet as a, as a capital of world commerce and culture, but London certainly held that throne. And she said uh, at this World's Fair Expo, she met this hugely tall man dressed in white who was a part of the Nepalese delegation to the fair, and that this was the first adept of hidden wisdom from the East who came into her life at the young age of 20 or 21, and 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 soon began her trajectory, she said. She traveled around the world to the frontier territories of Tibet, over all over the Near East, Far East, biblical lands, Egypt, and so forth. What do you make uh, of this idea that, because she did say that she went to Tibet during her decade and a half long travels. There's a lot of people that say that this never happened. What's what's your opinion? If, if it, did she ever go to Tibet or was it? Eh. I'm, 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 I guess I, I'd have to say I'm agnostic on the question, which doesn't yeah. mean that I don't believe her account and believe the critics or 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 vice versa. I, I, it's really hard to track there is an enduring industry of both supporters and detractors of Madame Blavatsky. And some detractors, for example, will point out that a woman traveling alone, who maybe is not in the best physical health, visiting the border territories of Tibet, is just 
ridiculously unlikely. I would point out that in 1878, she left the uh, relative comforts of New York City, and it was a comfortable city at that time. If you had money, you could take carriages around town. There was gaslight, there was coal heating, there was theater, there were restaurants, there was ice for your drinks. You could go out to Coney Island and go to the beach. She uprooted herself from those relative comforts, security, fame, a good deal of material safety and security to travel, and not just to travel, but to relocate entirely to the nation of India with a very small uh, circle, a very small nucleus of collaborators. And at that time, India was as unknown to most Westerners as the surface of another planet. Uh, the Beatles, you know, hadn't gone to Rishikesh to visit the Maharishi yet. You know, that, that right. was a, tucked off a century in the future. A Somerset Mom's travels to the East were tucked off a, a generation, literally, uh, into the future. And so HPB at the time was obese, not in good health, materially well situated in New York City, uh, famous. And she uprooted herself and left to totally unknown environs. Uh, so that's that's just one strand of what makes her this endless riddle and an extraordinary figure. And I, I hasten to remind critics, I hasten to remind them that we can debate all we like over what she did, what she didn't do, what she invented, what she actually accomplished. But what I just described is extraordinary by itself. And it's just one grain of her career and it's forensically verifiable. So it is really hard to place this figure into any sort of an easy category or box. She seems to have eluded all of them in life and in death. Definitely. Yeah, very, very true. Now, you mentioned something a little bit earlier, which I'm a huge fan of, which is uh, spiritualism. That was an enormous thing. Uh, I believe it was around 1848 with the Fox sisters in New York, mm -hmm. and they, they got that all running. But by the time Helena arrived in New York in 1873, how did this cultural and spiritual phenomena influence Blavatsky? Well, she was a critic of spiritualism. She believed that the phenomena occurring around the seance table, uh, when such phenomena was real in her view, was the result of so-called elemental spirits, these lower order of spirits, and that Westerners were not succeeding in talking to the dead, and that any physical phenomena that in her estimation was real was just the result of troublesome little poltergeists like Casper the Friendly Ghost gone bad and 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 that there wasn't much in the way of spiritual content to it. So she began her journey with a fascination over spiritualism and she said she wanted to come to America because it was the cradle of spiritualism and she felt almost like a Muslim approaching Mecca when when she succeeded in in completing this journey but soon after she became a critic of spiritualism, not from a materialist perspective, but from the perspective of feeling that its manifestations uh, themselves were uh, uh, trivial and that she felt there was so much more to open up the world to. So thereafter, that that became her life's mission. Definitely. Yeah. What do you think of these stories of because even Blavatsky herself at one point is like, I can produce incredible results through spiritual seances. She was like, she was like, I'm, I'm almost too talented that I can't take part. It's, it's like. Right. Well, uh, Colonel Olcott, uh, Henry Steele Olcott, who was a Civil War staff colonel who became Madame Blavatsky's key collaborator and was the co-founder of the Theosophical Society, himself an extraordinary figure who we could easily discuss for a whole show. It's almost, again, Colonel Olcott is one of these figures whose career would be remarkable if just one of the verifiable things about him uh, were on the record. He became kind of a wonderkind of scientific agriculture uh, just before the Civil War because he discovered a certain syrup plant that could replace the South's sugarcane <laughs> crop uh, if if Civil War broke out. And he, he wrote a monograph on this and he uh, rose up very quickly through the ranks of scientific agriculturalists. And this was all before he began his career either as a, a, a colonel, his job was to rat out military fraud among contractors uh, during the Civil War. And after the war, he actually became one of the first investigators of the Lincoln assassination, made some of the first arrests in connection with the Lincoln assassination. This was before he and Madame Blavatsky had even met. So he would be one of these wild, uncontainable 19th century figures had his life just gone off in a more 
ordinary direction right then and there. He would have interesting adventures to relate. But uh, of course, he met H.P. Blavatsky and everything, everything just went topsy turvy. And so it's it's interesting. You know, I, I think that um, she and her collaborators were capable of doing uh, so much in, in with so few resources, physically, uh, materially and otherwise, in such a small uh, a space of time. You know, they were they were together for just a precious few years. Her time in New York was just about three years. So. You know, she would approach things, she would sample them, she would taste them, and then she would just kind of blow them up and move forward with her own agenda, her own perspective. And again, uh, we've we've really never been able to contain it. Yeah, for sure. I want to put a pin in uh, Olcott and Blavatsky because, yeah, everything you said, an unbelievable person, even if he had never met Blavatsky. But what do you think Blavatsky and Olcott, how is their friendship together such an amazing thing, but what did they see in each other that allowed them to almost amplify their strengths? Well, I think Olcott had been a guy who always played by the rules in his life, uh, at least professionally speaking. And like a lot of people, he took hits. It was a more brutal time of life. People didn't have financial resources or safety nets. He enrolled for a year in in, uh, what eventually became New York University. And at that time, I believe it was called the University of the City of New York. And he had to drop out because his dad's business went south and they just didn't have the money to pay the tuition. And so he was someone who was embarking on a college educated career, but instead went out to Ohio to work on a relative's farm, which is how he began to develop experience as a scientific agriculturalist. He also got his first taste of spiritualism there or spirit raps because that was very popular activity in Northern Ohio, birthplace of the Ouija board, by the way. And uh, so shout out to Northern Ohio. Uh, and um, and NHPB, you know, on the other hand, was this I- 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 exotic, unclassifiable, heterodox, bizarre figure. When they first met, Colonel Olcott was visiting a farmhouse in uh, Vermont presided over by two brothers named the Eddy brothers and the Eddies claimed to produce all kinds of physical phenomena at their at their farmhouse and he and HPB met on the porch um, maybe this was about 1874 and she was wearing what was at that time known as a Garibaldi shirt or what we might think of as like a pirate shirt in a more right, Halloween right. sense it was a puffy shirt and 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 Garibaldi Giuseppe Garibaldi was a a democratic revolutionary who was fighting to unify uh, Italy. And he ignited the romantic imagination of many young people at the time who believed that the future belonged to democratic, constitutionally based republics. Italy was still divided into different duchies and, and districts ruled by local royalty, also ruled by the Vatican, which had its own district and private militia. And Garibaldi was fighting to bust all this up. He was a Freemason. HPB said that she joined him in the fight and uh, she raised her Garibaldi shirt up to show Colonel Olcott wounds that she had suffered from musket balls. And I think he found in her a completion of what he felt was missing in himself up till that time in adulthood. He he was a kind of would-be bohemian who, instead of acting the part of a bohemian was at that time uh, uh, part of the New York State Bar. He was a a lawyer who specialized in fire insurance, who actually, here's just another one of the odd facts about Colonel Olcott. He (laughs) he wrote some of New York's earliest statutes uh, regulating fire insurance, which are still on the state books today. See, again, you you, you just take a slice of this guy's career and it's it's an interesting life, uh, absent spiritualism and so forth. And and so she she formed his um, his 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 completed sense of self. She formed his completed sense of self. Uh, By the way, you had asked me previously about the so-called phenomena she was said to produce. And yeah, uh, I I got off on a tangent about Colonel Olcott. He wrote a six volume a series of biographies with the enthralling title of Old Diary Leaves, 
Um, if you want your book to attain posterity, do not call it Old Diary Leaves. That's one piece of advice. Um, and I retitled it and published it, ISIS in America, about oh. Madame Blavatsky. And, oh, okay. of course, this was just when the terrorist group ISIS was rising to notoriety around the world. And oh, man. My ex-wife said to me, well, no one could be dumb enough to do that. And I was like, uh, I, I just did that. So, anyway. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Old Diary Leaves, its title notwithstanding, actually is very enjoyable and at times even breezy reading. There is a, a photograph, a Victorian era photograph, probably not a daguerreotype, but a tin type photograph in the book of a pair of sugar tongs that Madame Blavatsky supposedly had manifested, ethereally manifested at one of the New York apartments that she and Colonel Olcott were sharing. So if you want, uh, you can get yourself a copy of Old Diary Leaves. It's reprinted. Uh, it's available online in, in archive form. And look at the Phantom Sugar Tongs. Um, I, I I think that the, the I, you know, I, I, I'm always between a rock and a hard place. It's kind of like somebody asking me, do you believe Moses parted the Dead Sea? And, you know, I, I sort of start to struggle for words, you know, because it's obviously a parable that shaped religious culture. And with Madame Blavatsky, it's interesting. We get to see how the sausages are made, in effect. Yeah. Uh, every religion, without exception, begins with supernatural claims, whether new religious movements or ancient longstanding faiths. There's always a supernatural claim, whether it's the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith uh, founding, you know, finding these, these documents of reformed hieroglyphs, giving him a new scripture, decoding them with, with a, a, a pair of metaphysically potent uh, glasses that were bestowed upon him by an angelic being. I'm not saying any of this in a glib way, I'm just trying to point out that every faith, old and new, has at its inceptive point claims of the miraculous. So you find that within Madame Blavatsky. And of course, I'm not going to say that, oh, that was true, that happened. I'm, I'm forensically defending that. I'm not. But I'm hesitant to kind of take out the old sledgehammer and say, by God, you know, there you go. The woman's a fraud. We'd have to say that in fairness about all of our founding religious figures, none of whose, very few of whom whose claims can be forensically examined or understood at this point. That might sound like I'm, I'm sort of eluding the question, uh, but that's, that's, that's how I feel. And, yeah. and if she did fabricate phenomena uh, shame on her, and I'll be the first one to stand up and and say so. And there may be people listening now saying, "If if you know how how dare you hedge on so basic a point?" And I I don't mean to hedge. I don't mean to hedge. I simply mean to point out that it's a strange strange world. I won't account for everything that occurs in it. I will insist that every religion, whether it be any of the Abrahamic faiths, any of the modern faiths any of the faiths migrating east, uh, most, most uh, begin with claims of the miraculous. And in Madame Blavatsky's case, those claims are Victorian age, modern, close enough to have pictures of. And uh, that makes us feel a little strange. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's it's odd. One of the major spiritualists, Daniel Douglas Home. He was very critical of Blavatsky. And that's, that's mm -hmm. one of those ones that like, because when you look at his the strange things he did. He's one of the kind of the ones you go like, holy man, if even a fraction of this is true, that's, right. that's crazy. And he was critical of Blavatsky. So it's a strange one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there for sure, Mitch. Mitch, I want to talk about a place where you are situated now, which is New York City. So what happened on the evening of September 13th, 1875 in New York? That was a huge event in the history of spirituality and the occult. Well, on the east side of Manhattan, uh, the Theosophical Society was formally founded by Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott. There was a small precursor group to the Theosophical Society called the Miracle Club, which yeah. I have a very loving uh, attachment to. And I entitled one of my books, The Miracle Club. And they were an informal group of seekers who got together as a salon with the interest of investigating extra physical phenomena and they didn't hang together very long but they eventually formed the nucleus of what became the theosophical society which had as its basis the study of all the ancient religions of the world and i think at the back of those efforts was the conviction on blavatsky's part that there was an occult or esoteric philosophy that fed 
all the different religious traditions of the world and their study uh, would help reveal the common river that, that ran underground feeding all these philosophies. It's one of those things where now it's tough for us to, to imagine, but how big was the Theosophical Society back in the day? Well, it was never large in terms of membership, but it hung heavily over the Western world because, partly because, frankly, Blavatsky was such a colorful figure herself, but the Theosophical Society was marked by an extraordinary effectiveness. For example, in 1876, Colonel Olcott introduced cremation into the modern Western world for the first time, at least publicly. Uh, cremation at that time was widely practiced in India. It was associated with the myths of faraway antiquity. But at the time, a proper Christian burial in the West was just that, a, a an interment in a cemetery, a burial, a service, etc. And Colonel Olcott made the contention that we Westerners could learn a lot from the practices of the East and from the practices of antiquity and that that cremation, in fact, was a, a more hygienic choice. Uh, it preserved land. Uh, it was more economical. And he made the observation in the Journal of the Theosophist, uh, in Hindu nations where cremation is practiced, one does not hear of cases of vampirism. So you can't argue with that. And <laughs> so he succeeded in performing a public cremation service in New York City in, in uh the summer fall of 1876, which caused a near riot. Uh, newspapers and critics complained that he was introducing heathen rites or pagan rites into the city. Uh, they wound up not performing the cremation until several months later in Pennsylvania at a private uh, crematory. Today, lo and behold, here we are speaking in 2022. In the United States, at least, uh, cremation is opted for in more than 50% of funerals. And that's a wild, wild change. I mean, yeah. here we are 150 years later where cremation was causing riots in New York City. And today it's the most popular funerary choice in the United States. So I say all this uh, because this is just one example of how dramatically effective the Theosophical Society could be. And this is why, you know, if people sometimes detect in me a tone of hedging when it comes to phenomena or the presence of these hidden masters, which we may talk about, or Madame Blavatsky's claims to be so world-traveled, if you detect in me hedging, it's not because I'm wishing to be any kind of an apologist or a front man for any of these figures. You know, I don't do that for anybody, but because those things that this cluster of seekers accomplished, of which I've touched on just the barest sliver, are so remarkable, so extraordinary in such a small, small space of time. And I've barely touched on anything. We haven't mentioned yeah. abstract art, politics, the democratic revolution in India that was, that was, that was uh, uh, completed by Gandhi. Uh, there's so, so much that, that if you look at what they accomplished later in life, just in the space of a few years and not in the best of health, these figures were drinking from waters that we do not commonly know. No. <laughs> they were remarkable figures. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's why I, I have this fool's gallery. A lot of these people are just, they're unbelievable in their time. And it's really hard for us to look back, which is why we, a lot of people just know the name and then they yeah. move on. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know Blavatsky. But it's like, look at the life and look right. at Look at the well, ideas. The is, you know, we're, we're educated to look askance at these figures and we're educated to find these people frauds and uh, charlatans, which quickly becomes a kind of boring. You know, once you've written off somebody as a fraud, there's not much more to say about the person other than than that. And yet those estimations are woefully incomplete. Uh, for example, I, I'll just reference in passing Gandhi himself wrote ingenuously and frequently from early in his life until just prior to his, his assassination uh, following uh, World War II about how a single meeting with Blavatsky in London ignited his development of a philosophy of human universality. And the sources are as plain as day. I list them in Occult America. They're in Gandhi's letters, articles, interviews, plain as day. 
Yeah. Uh, Joseph Lelyveld, who used to be the executive editor of the New York Times, very good man, very good journalist. He wrote an extensive biography of Gandhi. He could barely bring himself to mention Madame H. P. Blavatsky, barely bring himself to mention her. What I've just said occupies more space in terms of word count than what he mentioned about HPB in his dismissal in a 500-page biography. And it's because we can't revisit things that we have been educated in early in our lives and since moved on from. It requires too much in the way of revisitation, extra work, disapproval of peers. It's just infinitely easier to stick with what you learned growing up, which is that she was a nut, mention her for two lines, forget about her, and move on with the grown-up stuff. And that is incomplete and incorrect historically. Yeah, even Thomas Edison was enormously enamored with Blavatsky. Like, yeah. It's it's incredible. Yeah, the names uh, are are almost endless. I mean, yeah. you know, Thomas Edison, W. B. Yeats, Vice President Henry Wallace. It just goes on and on and on, uh, artistically, politically, and and so forth. Vasily Kandinsky, uh, Igor Stravinsky. I mean, the composers, the artists. Uh, it, it, she, I, I, I'm not. I, I don't think there's anyone within our contemporary world or culture to whom she could be compared. She just was a comet across the sky that yeah. that altered art, vocabulary, spirituality, and and our world would look very, very different today if it was not for her career. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of her, her work. So a text that was fundamental to the Theosophical Society was Blavatsky's first book, Isis Unveiled. So why do many historians of the esoteric consider the release of this book to be a landmark? Well, I would say Isis Unveiled was probably the first book published in the Western world on occult and esoteric themes that became must reading for artists, intellectuals, critics, people of all stripes who were engaged in art or the commerce of ideas. And it was also one of the first books, uh, probably since some of the works by uh, the Transcendentalist writers and a few other academic works along the way that introduced Westerners to certain Vedic or Eastern concepts. Blavatsky was among the first figures in Western life who persuasively and in a highly public manner got Westerners to understand that the East, uh, the nations of the East, particularly those nations that were under colonial rule at the time, India, Sri Lanka, a whole range of, of, of Eastern and, and in some cases Persian nations were possessed of a vast parabolic, ethical, cosmological, religious literature that was every bit the equal of and in some ways surpassing of in terms of depth, length, grace, and vintage uh, Western or Abrahamic religious literature. And I think that her influence helped Westerners because she was so popular a figure, helped Westerners for the very first time uh, think in terms of there being a tradition of wisdom teachers in the East, meditative and, and yogic uh, teachings. Uh, this was before the popularization of any of this material. You wouldn't hear terms like karma, reincarnation, uh, uh, meditation, the names of the Hindu deities, guru. I mean, all these things have entered our uh, domestic language today. There's almost no one walking around in the Western world who wouldn't know what is a guru, what is reincarnation, what is karma, and so forth. She has a part in, in that. She is partly responsible for that because she introduced these and Western occult concepts into the popular consciousness uh, for one of the first times in Western life. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting, I, reading Isis Unveiled years and years and years ago, because I knew all about, yeah, there's this, there's a lot to do with the East in Blavatsky's Blavatsky's cosmology and the way that she she views history and Isis Unveiled is very Egyptian. The Eastern stuff comes towards the end of the second yes. volume, but it's it's very very Egyptian. With, with the title Isis Unveiled, with, I don't believe that was the original title, but um, yeah, it's that's a weird one when when you crack that because if you come to that one first, thinking all of this Eastern stuff, you might be a little bit surprised that it's it's a lot to do with the Egypt as the absolutely true, yeah. absolutely true. I think that. At that time, Egypt, and to some degree this is still true, was seen as the fount of the mysteries. And 
That phase occupied Madame Blavatsky for probably just about three years. Once she relocated to India in late uh, 1878 with Colonel Alcott, her thinking ventured more in a Vedic direction. And that was to the frustration of many Western seekers who wanted training and ceremonial magic and, right. and, and the reaction against Blavatsky's turn to the East among some Westerners is what actually resulted in the development of, of certain organizations like Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, which was in effect uh, a mail order occult organization. Some insist that it had a deeper esoteric history, which it may well have, but it, it functioned uh, overtly in that way. Another such organization, of course, was the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which became hugely popular in its way among a circle of influential artists, intellectuals, writers. So even the reactions against Madame Blavatsky helped engender some of our modern culture. There were many Westerners, WB8s among them, who wanted to learn ceremonial magic, and she was no longer interested in that. So they began to look to other places, and out of these places emerged uh, a whole range of of teachers and occult figures like uh, S.L. McGregor Mathers, uh, um, uh, Alistair Crowley himself, of course, and uh, a, a, a very wide range of writing on ceremonial magic and attempts to revive ancient ceremonies that we may have had information about only in fragmentary forms. Uh, a whole wide range of renegade Freemasonic groups, for example, grew up contemporaneous to Madame Blavatsky, sometimes incidental to her, but sometimes, again, reactions to wanting a, a Western esoteric path that they felt she was no longer interested in or providing. So even those areas where people split from her, she instigated a, a branch of the spiritual culture. Definitely. One thing that we could probably spend a whole episode talking about is the trip that Olcott and Blavatsky took to, to India. So let's touch on this. How were they received once they arrived in India and, and what role did theosophy play in India? It's hard to contain what I'm about to describe because it's yeah. going to sound so wild that that good people will say that that simply can't be true. Once again, you know, Mitch is acting as an apologist for a group that he likes. He's carrying water for the weirdos. You know, uh, uh, he's exaggerating. And and all I can say is um, it's understandable to have that reaction because it's how we've been educated. And I would have had that reaction myself 15, 20 years ago. But I provide uh, resources for anybody who's interested in uh, the back of my first book, Occult America. I referenced that book only because that's that's my work that deals primarily front and center with these figures. They occur in the Miracle Club and other works. And I'm about to embark on a new book called Modern Occultism, which is a history of the modern occult. And cool. obviously these figures will dramatically re-enter. But for now, you can find the resources there. When Blavatsky and Olcott traveled to India, they embarked upon a variety of projects, one of which was Colonel Olcott's project, was which was his intent to revive uh, the practice of both Hinduism, but eventually, and most especially, uh, Buddhism in the nations of the East where these ideas had been squelched. So he traveled to Sri Lanka, Japan, throughout India, and he helped to uh, instigate a Buddhist revival that has colored those nations to this day. Uh, uh, Olcott's death day is celebrated as a national holiday in Sri Lanka, a nation where he appears on a postage stamp. He may be the only Westerner in Sri Lankan history uh, to uh, uh, appear that way on a postage stamp, almost certainly was the first. It's, it's almost difficult to overstate the impact Olcott's uh, speaking tours, helping to revive traditional Buddhist and Hindu practice in some of the nations of the East, where these traditions were under a great deal of assault economically and culturally by the machinery of uh, colonialism. Madame Blavatsky and Olcott together were deeply interested in Indian independence from British colonial rule. And they and some of their early collaborators, including William Kwan Judge, but others as well, uh, A.P. Sinet, helped to instigate in a very uh, direct and foundational manner the founding of the Indian National Congress, which became the policymaking committee of India's democratic revolution against British rule. And Madame Blavatsky's immediate successor, a British reformer named Annie Besant, 
it immediately she was somebody who studied under Blavatsky and became her her immediate successor and a highly influential figure in her own right. She became the first uh, woman and the last Westerner to be elected president of the Indian National Congress in 1917. Uh, she was a contemporary of Gandhi's. Uh, they collaborated and and fought. And so, in essence, the nucleus around H.P. Blavatsky uh, became the uh, formative apparatus in collaboration with uh, Indian activists of the earliest machination of the Indian independence movement. And their presence at that time in the late 19th, early 20th century, well up through the beginning and, and, and conclusion of World War I and beyond, was absolutely key. It was critical. They they are there even if if not named uh, as theosophists in almost every history of that movement. They might be identified as the British undersecretary of such and such. But if you trace the family tree, the the nucleus of of Western figures goes back to theosophy almost always and in every case. And Gandhi himself, as I was alluding earlier referenced uh, meeting Blavatsky uh, in 1889 in London when he was studying to become a lawyer, very lonely, very isolated, having a hard time, was invited to meet Madame H.P. Blavatsky and Annie Besant, and Gandhi very faithfully in numerous places, including an interview with an uh, American journalist named Louis Fisher, who wrote a biography of Gandhi, this was just before his assassination, uh, spoke very ingenuously of how Blavatsky's influence, the early influence of theosophy, was absolutely formative to him in devising his own sense of the equality of all religions, uh, basic human equality, human universality. And the early slogan of the Theosophical Society, I think, echoes in one of Gandhi's personal maxims. The slogan of the Theosophical Society is, was, and is, there is no religion higher than truth. And Gandhi famously said, um, all religions are true, to which he also added, and all have some flaw in them. I think you can hear an echo of that statement in Gandhi's maxim. And that's, again, just one fragment of HPB's uh, political and cultural influence. But what a fragment. I mean, India today remains the largest democracy in the world. There are nationalist threats and nationalist problems in India, as there are in the United States and elsewhere. They're very serious, but it is the largest democracy in the world. It is a constitutionally established democracy. Without the influence of Blavatsky and the theosophical nucleus around her, one can't suggest that wouldn't have happened, but it certainly wouldn't have happened uh, in the same way, on the same timeline, uh, with the same players. Her influence was just utterly formative. And again, this was a woman whose career might have wound down on the west side of Manhattan, you know, uh, uh, hosting journalists, uh, hosting an occult salon, engaging in witty repartee. And people wonder, well, gee, why the sympathy for this, this you know, figure? Wasn't she some carnival performer or something like that? And, and here, you know, this is just something she embarked on in the last decade of her life in ill health, relocated in a country where she had no command over the language, uh, no diplomatic credentials whatsoever, was suspected of being a Russian spy. Yes. She was opposing <laughs> British interests, was constantly uh, under criticism, maybe some of it well-deserved didn't speak uh, any of the local dialects or languages, had no immediate power base. And this is what she did. And that's just one fraction of her life towards its end. Absolutely. And definitely, if this is interesting, you people, there's there's so much to go on here. Please look it up. It is as incredible as, as Mitch has just described. So bad health. She was a chain smoker. She was mm -hmm. definitely obese. Bad health most likely forced Blavatsky to return to the West. I believe she spent time in Italy and then eventually into uh, to London, but it, it didn't affect her writing. So she released what many consider to be her magnum opus, which is The Secret Doctrine. Now you list The Secret Doctrine as one of the first, I believe the first in an article you released for Medium, the first crucial book for the occult seeker. So what is it about The Secret Doctrine which warrants this praise? Well, the book is just so formative of our terms, concepts, and reference points in the modern occult. 
I, I, I mean, there are many, many texts, including antique texts, that one could and should read. But it's critically important, I think, to have a, a some kind of a working familiarity with the secret doctrine, because so many of the themes that Madame Blavatsky develops in there morphed into later foundations of contemporary alternative spiritual culture, from, from channeling to the revival of witchcraft, the whole idea of there being this vast astral cosmological history, backstory to the, the human situation. And I, I, I think the other night somebody was saying to me that the Gnostic scholar Stephen Heller said, it's a great work of, of, of myth, which it is, but I think he was using myth in the same way that we might apply the term myth to scripture, in that it's, it's a mythos, it's a parable, it's a story of humanity's self-perception, uh, every bit as much as the psychological myths of the Hellenic world, the myth of um, Icarus and so forth, are, are, are similar stories of humanity's foibles and greatness. And so I don't think it's necessary to go into the secret doctrine, assuming that everything that's written there must be uh, immediately interpreted as correct forensic history. Uh, it's a sprawling, unwieldy, fascinating, frustrating uh, reinterpretation of the human story. And one just must have some familiarity with it uh, in the same way that uh, you, you have familiarity with, say, like a book like James Joyce's Ulysses, if you want to get into modern literature. It's an urtext. Yeah. And so that's that's why I encourage that people check it out. Definitely. Yeah, it is. It is worth the read. I actually think both books, Isis Unveiled and Secret Doctrine, should be read. People should be familiar with these books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the events of Blavatsky, but what did she actually believe? When when people look at her ideas, it seems a little bit iffy. There's things like root races. There's this perennial philosophy that it, all wisdom came from one source. You have Atlantis, Lemuria, and much more. So we could also do another episode about what Blavatsky believed, but in short, what do you think we can distill about Blavatsky and how her occult ideas uh, permeated out to her followers? Well, I think towards the end of her life, especially her beliefs, her personal beliefs had a great deal to do with the, the Vedic faith, the Hindu faith. She was very influenced by that. And she believed in concepts of karma and eternal recurrence, uh, not necessarily along the lines of reincarnation that Westerners reference today, where you're reincarnated uh, as a distinct personality. But she did believe that there is a a purpose uh, to life in which uh, uh, the, the individual moves through different trials and possibilities uh, towards some kind of uh, seat of creation and 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 re-enters the stream of life or the circle of samsara because all energy, including that which is life-giving, is uh, recurrent. And and as she believed uh, this probably departs uh, from Hinduism and more reflects contemporary New Age belief. She believed that humanity was climbing a kind of spiritual evolutionary ladder. There were these different root races and sub races as you were referencing, and that each successive root race and sub race and these successions could uh, take place over hundreds of thousands of years was going to be less bound by the coarse laws of physicality possessed more of powers of clairvoyance and telepathy and was going to be developed on a spiritual and extra physical scale in ways that represented quantum evolutionary leaps above past races. And of course, one of the great controversies around Blavatsky's work was this kind of proto-Darwinian, proto-evolutionary concept where she would talk about races in ways that make us cringe uh, today in races that, in, in, in ways that feel and, and that in some cases are uh, derogatory or almost seem uh, possessed of, reflective of a kind of uh, a manifest destiny when speaking about the succession of one root race over another. And the complexity of dealing with this is really considerable because as I was saying, you know, reactions against Blavatsky could be just as powerful as the ideas she brought. Uh, so could piracy and adaptations of Blavatsky. So there's no question that some of the early architects 
of racialist, fascist, and, and, and national socialist ideas within Europe were imbibing and clipping and pasting certain concepts from the secret doctrine. They probably hadn't read the secret doctrine. Uh, there's, uh, as Emerson said, there's a lot more accident in history than one supposes, but they came in contact with the ideas through different journals that might have uh, published adaptations or reiterations or regurgitations by writers who were infected with racialist ideas or proto-fascist ideas who found in Blavatsky not a message of human universality that Gandhi found, but found in Blavatsky a message that they thought suited their sense of exclusivist national renewal, and that this idea of uh, the superiority of races, which they imbibed from many different sources, including eugenicist sources, uh, they felt had a spiritual counterpart in Blavatsky. And so, for example, within the secret doctrine, you will find uh, a number of esoteric symbols that were introduced for the first time into Western life, including the swastika, which within Vedic religion, within Hindu religion, is a symbol of eternal recurrence. But the swastika was torn from its moorings, both historically and in terms of how it appeared in context in the secret doctrine, where it is presented as a symbol of eternal recurrence. And it was seized upon by early Nazi organizations as a symbol of exclusivist national rebirth, and it will remain forever after associated as such. But this is one of, of many examples in which ideas from the secret doctrine were clipped, pasted, reinterpreted in, in, in a very incendiary and, and in some cases even hateful way and remolded. There's this notion that somehow Blavatsky was the shadow architect of Nazi ideology. That is utterly absurd. It could be posited only by someone whose uh, reading diet consists chiefly Wikipedia. It's vastly more complicated than that, vastly more complicated. And the individual really owes it to him or herself not to gravitate towards these kind of reductionist soundbite clips of history, because it, it just simply brutalizes our history. And we as a generation would not want it done to us. We would not want it done to us. There's so much complexity and so many different folds within, within these lives and these expressions, and they were terribly potent, and they traveled in many different directions. So you have somebody who was a, a very deeply humanistic figure like Rudolf Steiner, who's both an esotericist and an educator who imbibed ideas from theosophy. I've already spoken about the influence of Gandhi. You know, the Nazis were never directly, uh, I think, incorporating, digesting any of this. They were pirating it. It was Flotsdam to be detached from its original sourcing, just like the quatrains of Nostradamus or just like aspects of astrology that they found sympathetic to their needs for propaganda at a given moment and, and reprocessed and repackaged. It's very important to understand that all esoteric and occult organizations were outlawed in Nazi Germany, Theosophy, Freemasonry, the, the OTO, Order of the Golden Dawn, you name it. And the, the, again, you know, I'm touching upon just fragments of the complexity of this situation. And I think that there were aspects of Blavatsky's writing and work that informed and touched radically democratic movements. There were aspects that informed and touched fascistic uh, movements. She was read everywhere and she was claimed uh, by everyone, sometimes with justice and sometimes without justice. I have an essay up on Medium called Fascism and the Occult, a brief comment, where I try to sort this out. It's very short. It's a very quick read. And I urge people to look at it because the temptation to be reductionist in this situation is overwhelming. But the actuality is a great deal more complex. Wow. I uh, I think people should listen to that again. That was wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, that it, we're dealing with the cult and people that listen to my show frequently. It's never as simple. And as, as Mitch just said, you can't just go off of something like Wikipedia. Again, these ideas were so eminent at their time. It's, it's really quite incredible. And very few people actually read the secret doctrine. And a lot of the ideas yeah. are just crypt wholesale from that. And, and I can tell you, and this probably won't surprise you given the state of our culture, but this has been true for a long time. I've read books 
by people who comment authoritatively on the secret doctrine, and I know they haven't read it because right. <laughs> you see the telltale signs, just like every middle school teacher can tell who has and hasn't read Lord of the Flies. You know, right. she knows, she knows you haven't read Lord of the Flies or Animal Farm or a separate piece, um, or Catcher in the Rye. You know, and and when you care about this literature, you can tell you know who's 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 drank from its waters, and there are people who write authoritatively, you know, pseudo authoritatively about it who have not read it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really quite sad. Well, let's while we're kind of down talking about uh, these, a lot of the I'm not going to say negative aspects of Theosophy and Blavatsky, but let's talk about something that as 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 working magicians we are. Uh, many folks in the occult these days pin the blame of blatant Orientalism, racism, resoundingly colonial attitudes, and cultural appropriation, and what makes a lot of New Age as well as modern spiritualities squarely on Blavatsky. Yeah. Mitch, is this fair? No, it's it's sophistry. Uh, it's really very, very deeply simplistic. I think for Madame Blavatsky's birthday at one time on Instagram, I posted a, a perhaps a letter that Gandhi had written about her, written in her tribute, and and some people said, "Look, you know, she's responsible for uh, genocide, Orientalism, so forth and so on." It's it's just so deeply complicated. And in fact, I would argue quite the opposite case could be made. I'm not going to beatify Gandhi. The man was no saint. He was a great figure. He's one of the greatest democratic voices of the 20th century. And that's saying something in a century that was dominated by a lot of voices that, shall we say, were not democratic. And and Gandhi stands out as a blazing exception. Why is there such a lack of interest in his career? You know, I mean, um, People used to nickname the History Channel the Hitler Channel. Those were actually the good old days, you know. I mean, they that, were, they were. That was like high quality compared That's to right. some of what's on there today. Right. But, um, but back in those good old days, you know, that was a reliable uh, source of programming because we're fascinated with this, with maleficence. Less so with somebody who's asking himself, how can we form a, a world that's based on some sort of universalist principles? Well, you know, I've made reference to the fact that, that Blavatsky and her immediate circle were deeply and profoundly involved in the Indian independence movement. They also knew when to exit the Indian independence movement. You know, I mean, Annie Besant uh, ceded power in in the Indian National Congress. You know, she didn't pull a Trump and stick around and say, well, you know, I still, you know, I'm in charge of this thing. I mean, she was, you know, president for her term and she was gone. And her her story and her history recedes as, 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 as India took charge of its own political and civic uh, affairs. And Colonel Olcott did a great deal to lobby, in some cases, very successfully colonial machinery from uh, uh, oppressing uh, 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 Buddhist or, or traditionally Vedic-based schools. And and then he left the world scene. You know, the, the, these people had their era, they passed, and 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 that, that journey they began was taken over by others very often who came from the, the political and social and religious order of some of these nations. Yes, they offered westernized interpretations of Vedic, Eastern, esoteric ideas. No question about that. And you wouldn't read Henry Steele Olcott's, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, maybe I'm thinking of A.P. Sinet's uh, Buddhist um, uh, catechism you know, mm-hmm. now to learn about Buddhism. But but they did play a role in exposing Westerners to these ideas in ways that they could accept so that when authentic figures of the East came to the West, like Swami Vivekananda, who visited the uh, World's Fair Expo in Chicago, 1890, Parliament of World Religions, Americans, journalists were able to make sense of who this man was, partly because they were familiar with the idea of gurus or adepts or masters from the East uh, emanating from the work of HPB. So again, it's just all too simplistic. It's just all too simplistic. And the story of religions has always been a syncretic story. The Roman Empire would invade territories and, and adopt, you know, certain figures as, uh, you know, as part of its own religious tapestry. Uh, the ancient Greek became the, the the administrative class ruling over Egypt, ancient Egypt, for several centuries. They identified Egypt's god Thoth with their own god of intellect and writing, uh, Hermes. They were, in some cases, referred to uh, Thoth as Hermes Trismegistus, uh, thrice greatest Hermes. 
you know, Thoth informed Hermes, Hermes informed Mercury, these things that uh, formulated some of the archetypes of the modern world, archetypes that we all live under. Religions have always been syncretic. The Abrahamic faiths you, you can't easily be separated. They can't, uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, they can't be separated from the other Mediterranean faiths that abounded around them and from which they absorbed ideas. Don't set this impossible standard whereby everybody, you know, who wouldn't qualify for tenure at Bennington today suddenly, you know, must wear this label of eugenicist and, uh, you know, genocidist and, and orientalist. And so it's just too simplistic. We can look back upon these people and identify their flaws. I'm terribly disappointed with the manner in which Madame Blavatsky in her era used and adopted some really degraded racialist language that came out of the outer rims of Darwinism, language that Darwin wouldn't have used himself. Maybe interpreters of Darwin here and there, like a Herbert Spencer, might have used some of that language. And one wishes she did better. You know, that's that's a criticism that I have of her. But you turn back the pages of any life from Florence Nightingale to, to Margaret Sanger to, you know, any figures uh, to Gandhi himself. And you, you find cause for grave disappointment. Let's talk about it. Let's know it. Let's teach it. Let's not run away from it. But let's also not behave in this reductionist manner that uh, 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 kind of reduces uh, complexity to 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 a slogan. It's it's just it, it's it's not going to serve our understandings of ourselves and where we come from. Here, here, yeah, that's very wonderfully put. Again, Mitch, it's this is great. So, Blavatsky, she she passed away in 1891 of the Russian flu, no less. Uh, with the last words, I love these last words, which are "Don't let my last incarnation be a failure." pretty badass, but <laughs> <laughs> I think we should all utter those words. In our <laughs> yeah, right. you know. uh, if we're all lucky, but uh, the vast majority of people who even look momentarily at the life and teachings of Helena Blavatsky will come away with the impression that she was a charlatan, a con artist, or as the Society for Psychical Research concluded, one of the most accomplished, ingenious and interesting imposters in history. They did say interesting. They, they did, did say it. They did I'd say like to point that out to your right. listeners. Okay. They did say interesting. <laughs> But Mitch, what are what are we to make of Blavatsky these days? For my own, I think she's, we will never see anybody like her. And I think when you see the tendrils of her influence, even to today, it's quite incredible that that she just did all of this from, from even if even if half of what she accomplished was a lie, the other half is still unbelievable. So so Mitch, what? Why do you think Blavatsky is worthy of our attention to this day? We'd be a different world without her. The contours of our world, religiously, culturally, artistically, politically, would be radically different without her. I think that she, even in 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 death, you know, now you know, here we are, many generations later, even in death, she remains a source of challenge because she eludes binary judgment. And we as a human community do not like that. We like <laughs> <No>. <laughs> binary judgment. <laughs> and so if you can call her a charlatan and roll your eyes, that's what you're supposed to do. That's how educated folk are supposed to behave in, in today's world. And that's been true for some time. But there's no single vessel in which Madame Blavatsky can be easily contained. It's funny, the religious philosopher Jacob Needleman has been an influence on me, and uh, he, like I, uh, is very interested in the ideas of uh, G.I. Gurdjieff, another East European uh, figure like H.P. Blavatsky, who is tremendously controversial. And um, people always try to approach Gurdjieff's ideas, his philosophy, and they say, it's like this or it's like that. And Jerry has an expression, it's not like anything, you know, and she, Blavatsky, she wasn't like anything. She wasn't like anything. Uh, I don't believe and I don't swallow every claim or story that she tells. And yet I also can't bring myself to wave a knowing 21st century figure and uh, a finger at her and say, you know, shame on you, you charlatan, you carnival performer, because sometimes 
Uh, this was an expression of Guruji. It's the truth in the form of a lie. She brought the truth in the form of a lie. He wasn't specifically pointing at her to to make that claim, but but there were things that she exposed us to possibilities, including some of the premises that the British Society of Psychical Research, which roundly condemned her, as you alluded, were founded on itself, which was the question of whether psychokinetic or psychical or, or extrasensory related claims were worthy of investigation. And I think they have proven worthy of investigation. I have a new book out called Daydream Believer, where I write about that quite extensively and quite rigorously with enough footnotes to please um, yeah, the, 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 any auto dictat you know, among us and, and myself included. And the premises and the possibilities that she brought into our world were so vast, it's as difficult to imagine our lives without her today as it would be to imagine our, our pop culture without the Beatles. And, and the Beatles sojourning to Rishikesh to visit the Maharishi in 1967. They were walking in the silent footsteps of, of H.P. Blavatsky and Olcott. The idea of making a sojourn to the East, again, a, a, a widely familiar trope within Western letters was unknown in 1878. They were the first. They went there without a map. And so, again, there's just example after example where Blavatsky and her nucleus formed aspects of our psyche of our current world. And if we damn her, we're damning ourselves. I love it. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Yeah. To speak to the listeners here, there's very few individuals that we have over the last 160, 75 years. Blavatsky is one that I think everybody needs to know to just get a handle. You don't necessarily have to dive deep into her ideas, although it might very well help. But she is such an insular and amazing character. Her story is wonderful. And she has changed the world. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say that about very many people. And so I I personally love Blavatsky. And I don't think enough people trumpet her enough. And I want to mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Mitch, for being one of the people who actually stands up and says, we need to know about Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, when I first started my book, Occult America, and and other uh, journeys and adventures that I went on, I always had the intention that Blavatsky and Olcott would form a critical part of it. It was only as I started peeling the layers of the onion that I realized how her influence just touched everything across our world, including influences that were conveyed by people who were successors to her, like Annie Besant. I recently wrote the forward to um, a republication of a book called Thought Forms that Annie Besant and Charles Leadbeater, second generation theosophy leaders, published in 1905. The book is widely credited, including by Vasily uh, Kandinsky, as, as forming the germination of abstract art. If, if, if contemporary people look through it, they'll see the germination of psychedelic art. It's, it's hard to contain. It's hard to contain the reverberations of her influence. 100%. And uh, terrible segue here, but hard to contain. Mitch, you have... <laughs> you have Two books, one that just came out called Daydream Believer. You have another book coming out on certain places. Uh, man, you write so much. Blavatsky, I believe, only wrote four or five books. You you put out four or five <laughs> books a year. What's going on? <laughs> well, I work really hard. I care yeah. very much about my topics. I would say one thing that's going on is this. I didn't publish my first book until I was 43 years old. And I always like people to know that because... We think that we reach a certain time in life and, well, gee, we're settling down and all of our uh, assumptions are laid out before us. But in fact, having not published my first book until what I suppose would be considered early middle age was a greatly fortuitous thing for me because I never take it for granted. I didn't grow up expecting it. I didn't uh, occupy my 30s expecting it. And it was it was only a little later in life that I began on this journey. So I I value every hour of it. I, I do not ever take it for granted. And that fuels some of my passion. Absolutely. So tell us what uh, Daydream Believer is about. That's the book you just released. Right. Daydream Believer is just out. That is my reckoning with the question of mind causation uh, or what is sometimes called new thought. In its most popular forms, it'll go under terms like a law of attraction or power of positive thinking or the secret. None of those are really terms that I favor for reasons that I write about in the book. And I have deep criticism of all of them. They're flawed notions flawed notions that nonetheless contain instincts for actualities of human nature. And I try in a manner that I think is, 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 is written with hardcore critical observation, 
but also appropriate sympathy where such sympathy is justified to hash out what's veritable in these ideas and uh, how and whether they present a path for a mature person. I'm really proud of it. I think it's the best practical book I've ever written. Amazing. Wow. I can't wait to pick that up. And do you have a book coming out in October, I believe, called yes. <laughs> Uncertain Places. Tell us a bit about Uncertain Places. The Uncertain Places is a collection of my essays on occult themes, ranging from Gnosticism to Satanism to psychical research. And I suppose uh, it represents a kind of culmination of my own personal grappling with these ideas over the past 20 years or so, what I've come to, what I believe, what my outlook is. There's historical portraiture in there as well. Uh, some of the very figures we've talked about during this episode uh, are explored and examined and x-rayed in that book. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to present a collection of my short pieces. Wonderful. So you just also released a movie, The Kabbalion, the film, I believe it is out. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Is there yeah. is there any more dalliance into filmmaking or what? I, I, I guess I should I should ask after these two books are released or sorry, the next book, Uncertain Places, is released. What next for Mitch Horowitz? Well, uh, right now I'm teaching a class called Daydream Believer, which is okay. based on the book. I am uh, narrating and assembling a variety of different uh, uh, books and anthologies. And my next major book that I'm working on is Modern Occultism, which is going to be a history of the modern occult from the Renaissance up through the, the present era. Amazing. Can't wait for that. I will have links to all the places that Mitch is. Mitch is, he's everywhere. So that's Instagram, Twitter. He's got his own Patreon as well. Definitely check out his Patreon and his personal website. Those will all be available at the show notes on what magic is this.com. There's going to be some uh, interesting show notes for this one, including a website that you have to check out. It is like it is straight out of 1995. My goodness. For those of us that remember the internet of 1995, this website is a real treat, but there's also some really great information there. So anyways, all those show notes will be available at what magic is this.com. Also there, you can find my Twitter account, my Instagram account, as well as my Facebook account. If you enjoy the podcast, please tell a friend, tell a friend, and then perhaps they'll tell a friend, and then those friends will tell a friend. And that's how this whole chain of enjoyment that could be what magic is this gets shared. Uh, I really appreciate the word of mouth. That is the best way of uh, giving me a little bit of publicity and a little bit of a uh, press. I just, it's just me. It's just me doing all of this. I don't have a secretary yet. I don't have any of that kind of stuff. So uh, I am my own secretary, which is awesome because uh, yes, um, it's a one man band at this point. If you also enjoy the podcast, please leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or any Playtunes. Yeah, there's the whole star clicky thing. That's nice. It's okay. But I prefer maybe if uh, you have some things to say, particularly on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, just write something. Just say like, I really enjoy this podcast. It's really great. Doug's got a really sexy voice. He's he's amazing. His details are fantastic. It's the best guests. Any of stuff like that would be appreciated. Don't have to write a whole essay, just a few sentences. People do read those and perhaps they might be uh, enthused to check out the glory. That is what magic is this. Let's say you think that I'm doing something kind of cool and kind of important. And perhaps you'd like to show your support in some kind of monetary cash based way. Well, there's three ways of doing that. I'm going to take you through all three. Hang in there. I do this every episode, but uh, I try to change it up each and every time I talk and I might say something funny or silly. Who knows? But uh, the first way of supporting me is the absolute best way. And that is through Patreon. That is only $7 a month. That can be found at patreon.com slash what magic is this. I have one tier. That's it. $7. That's all I'm asking for. That's the price of a shitty house plant that's in the bargain bin at Home Depot or one of those other large chain box stores. That is a price of a, I don't know, a bag of chocolate covered pretzels from uh, some bulk foods place. That is the price of three ounces of Wheat protein. I don't really know. I don't drink that shit. But uh, if you do, cool. You're looking good. And keep up the great work. Uh, your bod's going to be amazing. Anyways, $7 a month. That is all I ask. That's nothing. And that gives you access to videos in which I teach you how to do really cool and crazy things like set up an ancestral altar or make your own incense. It's wonderful. I also have full audio episodes involving lots of really cool things. I just put up an episode about 
somebody who's basically considered like the forefather of Canadian archaeology and how he would use a psychic to help him with his archaeological work. It is an amazing story. It's a fantastic story. And I think more people need to hear it, but that is only available on Patreon. So it's almost like a whole different podcast. And I try to put up as much stuff there as I do for this regular podcast. And that's where I put, I'm not, I'm just going to say that is my favorite stuff. Um, I really put a lot of work into it. And I don't think people realize that I put almost as much work into that as I do for the regular podcast. It's all my favorite stuff. I I know I just said that, but it's so amazing. I talk about grimoires. I talk about gods. I I have these really cool stories. I even talked about pirates, um, (laughs) magician pirates, kind of in a way. Yeah, it's, it's really quite wonderful. And so that is all available on the Patreon. It also gives you access to a Discord server. I have a lot of people reaching out to me and asking me questions through the, the various forms of social media that I'm on. If you join up to Patreon, that's the best way of getting a hold of me. I'm on there all the time. You can ask as many questions. I have people there on the Patreon that are former guests. I have people that are just starting in magic. I have people who are, been, well, they're long tenured in magic. They've been doing it for a long, as long, if not longer than me. And you get to ask them questions. It's great. We, we've really had a fantastic time over the last two weeks because there's been a lot of questions about the I Ching and Man, I love that. And just seeing people's enthusiasm for the I Ching becoming, you know, kindled, this newfound love for the I Ching. I love to see it. But all of those things are available at patreon.com slash what magic is this or head to what magic is this and click any one of the tons of support me on Patreon buttons there. It's all wonderful. It really helps me. That is where I want to see you. And again, $7 a month. That is chump change. The second way of supporting me is through something like PayPal. I have PayPal me links all over whatmagicisthis.com. Just click on any one of them. You know, that double P symbol, although they just changed their logo recently. So I'm not going to update my uh, my buttons. Anyways, you know the PayPal logo. Just click on the logo. You can donate $5, $10, $20, $2,000. You can donate 50 cents. Uh, it all goes into helping keep this podcast running. This is not cheap. Some people say like, yeah, I can show you how to make a podcast for $100. Yay. And you'll never have to spend money ever again on podcasting. I say, no, I want to give you the best product possible as far as this podcasting thing is concerned, but that does cost money. So anything donated through the PayPal goes right back into keeping the, the hamster wheel running for what magic is this. And yes, any amount helps. Um, it is greatly appreciated. And I have some people that have donated some money recently. That is wonderful. I love you. Thank you so much. Um, But yes, unfortunately, it does not give you access to the the wonderful goodies that exist on the Patreon. That is where I want to see you. So I guess the the PayPal pitch is a little bit of a Patreon pitch in disguise. All right. Uh, The last way of supporting me is through merchandise. Head to whatmagicisthis.com. Click on the menu. You'll find the merchandise button there. You can buy t-shirts, tote bags. I just got myself a tote bag. Man, I love the tote bag. It looks great. I can't wait to walk around with it. And (laughs) it looks really quite wonderful. Uh, What else do we have? Magnets, uh, stickers, notebooks. The notebooks look so great. Man, I love my notebooks. They look wonderful. All of them have my logo on it. And I've got about six designs up there. Most of them were created by my my very own wonderful hand through, uh, I don't know, some kind of Photoshop-ish device uh, app that is, comes with every Macintosh. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I, I really enjoy my logos and they're quite fancy. And uh, yeah, they're all over the merchandise. So, you know, it's not the best way of supporting me. I get very little from it, but it uh, it also helps do a little bit of advertising for me. And uh, that is always appreciated. And then when you're walking down the street, somebody's like, hey, what magic is this? And you go like, I'm the magic. But also there's this podcast called What Magic Is This? And you should check it out. Head to whatmagicisthis.com. Uh, I also grab a t-shirt. And uh, yeah, maybe that's kind of like the, the chain of what magic is this t-shirts? That's how that happens. Anyways, going on for a long time here, but uh, yes, grabbing merch is also a really great way of, uh, of supporting the show and uh, showing your love for this wonderful thing that I got going here. But again, the reason I do this at every episode is because I want to see you on the Patreon. The Patreon is, uh, that's, uh, that's the great stuff. That's how I, uh, how I live. I'm so thankful that this podcast is my job. I mean, 
Uh, if I was to break it down, I'm not making very much per hour with the amount of work I put in here, but you know what? That's a minor complaint. I wake up every morning and I love what I do. It stresses me out, but that's a good kind of stress because, uh, you know, it's there's nothing better than uh, having your dreams come true and we're well on our way, at least for me. So uh, the only way that that happens is through uh, through your support. Uh, but yes, Patreon is where I want to see you. But all of these things, everything I've talked about and rambled about over the last little while are available at whatmagicisthis.com. Head over there. Mitch, I want to thank you so much for uh, for joining us on this episode. Man, we we did a sprint through the life of <laughs> the 60 years that Blavatsky was on this planet. It, we just, there's so much that we didn't mention. Man, I, I just feels, yeah, it, it feels like we, uh, I think we did our justice, but there's so much more. Yeah, I appreciate the chance to talk about it. And um I, I, I hope people found it engaging. She, she's a figure who it's it's a very tough needle to thread because she was such a figure of, of complexity. And um, I think in a certain sense, with regard to her legacy, there's so much that we've talked about from a historical perspective, but perhaps a part of her legacy is that she challenges a binary thinking and that will always be the case uh, approaching her career. 100%, that's, that's wonderful. Mitch. Thank you again. I would hope that sometime in the future, if we wanted to have you back on the show, you'd be uh, you'd be conducive to said being so. Delighted. Absolutely delighted. Thank you. Yo. Wonderful. That is the show, everybody. That was Blavatsky. Let's we'll come on back to what magic is this. We'll talk about more of this pondering over the Akashic record, this astrally projected, <laughs> this wonderful thing that we call magic and the occult. Until then, I want you to stay happy, stay healthy, and stay luminous. We will talk at everybody soon. Goodbye, everybody. Ta-ta for now. Bye-bye.